Hello everybody and welcome to my channel. Uh, if you like, please hit the like button and please subscribe. And thank you for my subscribers already. And God bless you. You are a blessing. The New York City lawyer who tossed uh, a Molotov cocktail. It's M-O-L-O-T-O-V cocktail at a New York PD patrol vehicle during the George Floyd riots in May of 2020 is asking for a light sentence in federal prison, arguing, arguing that she was drunk and under the stress of early trauma caused by being a Muslim in America. Ruho Ha Ruhoa Rahman R A H M A N thirty three said in court papers filed by her lawyers that she had been drinking vodka on an empty stomach on the day of the firebombing and that she had become quite drunk by the time that she and fellow lawyer Colinford Mattis thirty four set the NYPD car blaze in the city's Fort Green neighborhood near a police station house. Her filing argument argued that the firebombing was a way of expressing anger at those police officers around the county for whom black lives did not matter. Rahman's lawyers argue in the papers that the attack was somehow an act of protest tended to avoid exposing others to harm. Despite her claim that she should not be held responsible because she got drunk that day, reports indicate that she sounded sober less than an hour before setting the police car on fire. At that point, she said in a video interview that the ongoing protests were appropriate since people are angry because the police are never held accountable. She was reportedly speaking clearly at that time, also saying, this has got to stop. The only way they hear, the only way they hear us is through violence, through the means that they use. Oh my goodness. The young lawyer pleaded guilty in federal court in October 2021 to throwing the Molotov cocktail. I know I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but I'm sorry. <clears throat> in June of this year, Rahman, R-A-H-M-A-N, reached a revised plea agreement under which she admitted to conspiracy to commit arson and protection of a destructive device. Possession of a destructive device. Prosecutors at that time advised the court they were seeking sentences between 18 and 24 months. Rahman's sentence, sentencing since, <clears throat> here I go again, sensing <laughs> hearing is scheduled for next month, at which time she is expected to be credited for the 28 days already served in federal jail in Brooklyn before she posts, posted $250,000 bail. Rama's lawyers also wrote that she should be given a light sentence because of abusive partnership relationships and the injustices she has witnessed here and abroad. The papers say that she has assisted refugees in Turkey and Greece and has helped people avoid eviction in New York. <clears throat> Police Benevolent, Benvol, Benvolent Association Director Patrick Lynch told reporters that Rahman deserves no mercy from the court. He said she remains committed to a violent and anti-police ideology and continues to basic, baselessly smear police officers in her bid for a lighter sentence. Well, my, I don't know what to think about that one. I wish she'd have thought it over a little bit better before doing that violence. Because we all 
and I mean all colors, were listening to that uh, protest and what people were saying about that young man. Because black lives do matter. They do matter. Bless her heart, I just, I don't know, but she, she should have thought things out. See, we jump to conclusions so often without thinking and get ourselves into a lot of trouble, don't we? Even though she thought she was doing right, it was still wrong. But she did the crime. She's got to do the, the time. Or whatever the judge lays upon her, and she knows this, I know she does. My goodness. Well, God be with her. Yeah. That's all we can do is just say the Lord, you know, be with her. But when it comes to crimes, excuses don't always weigh out. No, they don't. And the George Floyd riots, we all saw it. We felt bad for the family, gave her condolences, and because that was not right. Dear, dear, dear. People do need our prayers. Yes, they do. Well, here's another article that I came upon. And this is about the COVID unemployment fraud. Feds reported staggering $46 billion in COVID unemployment fraud. And uh, I do think I have probably already done this one. But, uh, let's see, I got a pull my wings in here, what I call them. Just for a minute here, because I gotta uncover my camera, or I'll lose it. But I think I have already done this, but they are finding more, is what the deal is. I do believe on this pandemic-related unemployment fraud has reached staggering, per staggering proportions, according to a report from the Labor's Department's Inspector General. Everything from claims in multiple states to dead recipients or even federal prisoners were used to strip funds from unemployment insurance. With the astounding, astonishing total of $46 billion acknowledged as only a starting figure, the federal government does not even have solid data on the true scope of the potential fraud. Experts also note that the investigators do not have current data on federal prisoners, meaning there is no way to ac accurately update payments of a suspicious nature to this group. Fraud from state prisoner prisoners is not even listed in the Labor Department's numbers. And from the investigators' own words, there is a little likelihood that most fraudsters, fraudsters will be held accountable. In other words, they're going to get away with it. As the accompanying release states, the Labor Department is limited by having less than 140 criminal investigators to call C-U-L-L through the massive fraud. That would be a big job. In fact, a press release specifically states that the Inspector General is focused on large-scale identity theft schemes involving multiple victims, many of which are related to street gangs. There has been progress made with the pandemic relief fraud including the Justice Department's recent announcement of a massive $250 million scheme broken up in Minnesota. At least 47 individuals face charges in defrauding the government's Free Meals for Children program. That's the one I did before. Yes. But for unemployment fraud, which encompasses tens of billions of dollars at a bare minimum, 
there is a little retribution. Without belonging to a street gang or submitting suspicious claims for ten thousands of dollars, there is precious little chance of prosecution. The Labor Department notes that roughly a thousand individuals have been charged with crimes and several have been convicted, calling it a tip of the iceberg hardly speaks to the scale of the criminal activity. Many were harmed by the government lockdowns of 2020 and there is little relief for those seeking justice. With the ineffective state-federal partnership that operates the nation's unemployment system, justice is also unlikely to be served for those stealing from the truly needy. It just goes on and on and on, don't it? My, oh my, oh my. Mm-mm-mm. Well, let's put that one up there. And let's see what this one is right here. I'm twiddling them down. I had a bunch. <laughs> I did. I did my homework, even though I wasn't on cam. Uh, this one is Biden's week. Wandering away from handlers, calling out to deceased lawmaker. Now, this is the one where that lady was killed in an automobile accident. And in his speech, at the time of his speech, evidently, he, he knew but couldn't remember that she was deceased. In a week filled with important domestic and international news, the headlines made by Joe Biden largely have to do with his continuing con connective decline. On Wednesday, Biden spoke to a conference on hunger, nutrition in Washington. When thanking a group of bipartisan lawmakers who had spearheaded the conference, he called out for recently deceased Representative Jackie Walorski, Walorski W-A-L-O-R-S-K-I, Republican of Indiana, and she was the one killed in the car accident. He looked around the room and asked, Where's Jackie? I think she was going to be here. Mm. Walorski died in a tragic traffic accident in August. The Biden White House issued official condolences when she died, and Biden himself ordered flags at the White House to be lowered to half-staff in her honor. I do believe I did a video on that. Yes, but not this part. Following his Thursday speech at the Office of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, Biden said thank you before apparently becoming confused. He turned to leave the podium to his left stopped short, turned to his right toward some attendees at the event and shook some hands. The FEMA official who was standing with Biden near the podium can be heard on the video of the event calling out Mr. President to Biden as he turned away, apparently heading off in a direction his handlers did not want him to go. If Biden heard her, he ignored her. The FEMA official followed after Biden as he slowly walked over to a group of people in the opposite direction he was being steered toward. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas was also in attendance and showed a worried expression as Biden wandered into the staff area. Biden was eventually herded back in the right direction. Then on Friday, Biden delivered remarks at the White House for Rose Hashiana, Hashiana after repeating the old Democrat, Democratic false talking point that President Donald Trump, good people on both sides, comment after Charlottesville was somehow praised 
for neo-Nazi, Biden again found himself in trouble. Jill Biden was on stage with her husband when he completed his remarks. He appeared confused about where to go, froze in place before asking Jill something inaudible. When she responded with a curt no, reporters in the crowd began shouting questions at the president. Before he had a chance to consider whether to speak to the reporters, Jill began ushering Joe in the correct direction to leave the stage. Vice President Camilla Harris and her husband Doug Emhoff, Emhoff, E-M-H-O-F-F, -F, were also on stage and looked as if they didn't know what to do to help Joe find his way. Although Emhoff tried to be helpful by pointing out to Biden the direction he should be going. Unfortunately for Americans, the country and the world are now left wondering what the next mental lapse will look like as tensions in Europe are reaching new heights amid the sabotage of the Nord Stream pipelines and the announcement by Russia that they are now cutting off overland energy deliveries to EU nations through Austria. My oh my. No words. I feel bad for him. <clears throat> no words. God love him. Even though we're in such a bad place right now. But you know, the thought crossed my mind. These signs had to show up before he became president and somebody knew it and they just kept pushing him and pushing him to become president they knew he was weak mentally unstable in certain areas that's my thought only what do you think leave me a comment Laters, God bless you.